in public health seminar. My name is Jennifer Dio. I'm one of the core faculty at the Cochlear Center. And I'm gonna start by just talking through a couple of um, slides by way of background. So in terms of logistics for today, so this is a webinar. Um, there will be a Q&A uh, session after the presentation. If you are online, please use the question and answer function through Zoom, and then we'll ask your questions on your behalf. Um, any questions that you sent will be sent to the panelists only. We do have closed captioning provided in Zoom. There is a link here to access the transcript through CART. Just to let everyone know this seminar is being recorded. And if you have any difficulties, um, technical difficulties, please contact um, the email address shown here, jhcochlearcenter at jhu.edu. Um, just an update on um, some current events or, or future events that we have coming up. So on Thursday, March 28th um, at 12 noon, we'll have Dr. Daniel Powell, who's an audiologist and the first PhD um, from the Department of Epidemiology. So first AUD trained PhD here um, at Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. Um, she is currently faculty, junior faculty at the University of Maryland. Um, so for those of you who can join us in person, it will be here in Page Hall, W2030 uh, in the Wolf Street building. Um, there will also be Zoom options as well. And please do mark your calendar. We have a wonderful event every year, the Cochlear Center Research Day. Um, that will be Friday, April 19th. It is an all-day affair, and we hope you can join us for as much as you can. Um, starting in the morning from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, we will have breakfast, um, a welcome, and then we have a, a series of great speakers um, that will be um, in person. So these are uh, speakers and collaborators, a lot of whom have um, worked with us on our randomized trial for hearing intervention and cognitive decline, the ACHIEVE study. So we welcome Dr. Victoria Sanchez, Dr. Teresa Chisholm um, from the University of South Florida, Dr. Allison Wong here at the School of Public Health, and uh, Mr. James Pike, who will also be presenting. Our keynote address is by uh, Erasmus Leroy that day from Trinity College Dublin School of Medicine. She runs the SenseCog study, um, and we'll have lunch and poster sessions to celebrate all of our student accomplishments. It really is, I think, one of the best days of the year, and so we hope that you can join us for as much as you're able to that day. The registration link is uh, available on the slides. And so with that today, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Heather Whitson, who will be presenting on resilience to health stressors, hearing and opportunity. Dr. Heather Whitson is an internist, geriatrician and clinical investigator. She's a professor of medicine, ophthalmology, neurology and head and neck surgery and communication sciences at Duke University. She's director of the Duke Center for the Study of Aging and Human Development, also known as the Duke Aging Center and co-director of the Duke UNC Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. She received her undergraduate degree from Stanford University, her medical degree from Cornell, and completed her medical training and a master's degree at Duke University, where she's been on the faculty since 2008. Her overall goal of her work is to optimize independence and resilience in people in multiple chronic conditions. She has expertise related to how the aging process um, and comorbidities affect the brain. I'm working a lot with transdisciplinary teams. Her work has improved outcomes for people at risk of vision impairment and cognitive impairment. She's been an active contributor and thought leader in the emerging field of physical resilience, and we get to hear a lot about that today. Um, she has, through several institutional and national leadership roles, coordinated and facilitated efforts to broaden the evidence base and research workforce to improve knowledge and care decisions for medically complex older adults. Um, so a really fantastic friend of the center, a collaborator for a long time. She's been incredibly supportive of us junior folks as we come up in this space, um, worked closely with the center even before the center was a center on some um, seminar series and, and collaborations to think about where we needed to go in the field of sensory health and aging. Um, and she has a, a number of awards, but has been also awarded the prestigious American Geriatric Society, Thomas and Yokoshawa Award for Outstanding Scientific Achievement in Clinical Investigation. So Dr. Woodson, we're so happy that you're joining us today. Thank you. Well, thank you. I am um, 
delighted to be here. And, and as was mentioned, I've been following this center for a long time, even before it was a center and a good friend of Franklin's and just really happy to have the invitation to be here. Um, and happy to talk to you about one of um, the topics that is one of my most favorite topics, both at work and at home, um, this idea of resilience. Um, and I will start by saying, I don't think I have any relevant disclosures for today. I'm uh, really funded by the feds um, and do some work for the American Geriatric Society, the Alzheimer's Association. Um, the outline for today's talk is the main thing that I, we're going to start out with a sort of very conceptual talk about this construct of resilience. Um, the word resilience is frequently used in medical and public health research. Some people would say overused, um, but I want to sort of um, try to help navigate the landscape of all the different ways that resilience is being used um, in the hopes that you'll sort of appreciate why it resonates with so many different camps of people and types of different disciplines and is therefore a helpful construct and to try to avoid some of the pitfalls um, of, of using resilience um, without, the, without the full picture of the landscape of how it's getting used. Um, then I'll try to give just some data, one relevant example from my own research. I mostly um, focus on how vision impairment affects the aging brain. And so I'm going to give an example of my work there in the hopes that that serves as sort of a, a prototype or a template of how we might think about doing similar things with a similar type of study or asking similar questions with hearing impairment and the aging brain. And then I'm going to try to um, make a very shameless plug um, for data that we have in the new Duke UNC Alzheimer's Disease Research Center because we are collecting audiometry. Um, and uh, would love to, to invite um, collaborators to potentially use uh, the data sets that we're putting together there. Um, so first, just as I said, you know, you're sort of seeing resilience everywhere. There is a whole uh, trans NIH resilience working group um, that has representation from, I think, almost every institute um, at, at the NIH. Um, and so um, within NIA and aging research circles, um, there's been a, like, like in many of the other disciplines, we, we have had a lot of real interest in resilience and, and the um, particularly recognizing the importance of resilience to stressors as people age, because the frequency of stressors increases as we age, and also our ability to respond to stressors sort of uniformly changes as people age. So resilience is this, I would, I would argue, an especially important construct in aging research. Um, and it has, is being elaborated, um, especially this idea of physical resilience. So what do I need, mean by physical resilience? So I think it's maybe helpful first to think about sort of like this is what I've called a brief and surely incomplete um, history of sort of um, how resilience as it relates to aging related health related research has evolved over the past 25, 30 years or so. So in the 1990s, there was a lot um, of work on this kind of psychosocial construct of resilience. So that really looks at how a person adapts or copes with stressful events in their life. Those events could be health events, um, like a, a new illness or diagnosis, but, but oftentimes the early development of this construct in the psychosocial world was really looking at sort of psychosocial stressors. So it could be anything from loss of a spouse, to loss of independence, um, to you know, some suffering some sort of major psychological trauma, um, and then I would say over like the '90s and early 2000s, lots of different tools um, kind of developed and were well validated as measures of this idea of of a person's psychosocial resilience, conceived as their their um, ability to adapt to and cope effectively from a psychosocial standpoint um, with with stressors that they may encounter. Then in 2011, Barbara Resnick introduced what was termed a physical resilience measure. But really, if you look at her measure, and some of you may be familiar with the Resnick resilience, physical resilience measure, it is, it is very much based in the psychosocial literature. So it is again trying to measure a person's psych, psychological readiness to encounter a major physical stressor. So and she did a lot of her work looking at hip fracture. But the measure is, is something that you would administer to a person, presumably before they had a hip fracture or some kind of a surgery. And it's a gauge of how well their sort of psychological 
temperament and, and makeup is going to prepare them to, to recover and, and do the hard work of recovery and rehab after an, an intervention like that. That really sort of, I would say, <laughs> soon after that, resilience kind of moved into the much more biomedical kind of space. Um, with several NIA workshops, actually a workshop that was held by all four of the divisions of NIA, trying to sort of elaborate this construct of resilience as it was relevant to the work that that particular division of NIA was doing. So there was a workshop on measuring resilience in laboratory chemicals. Um, there in the um, division of neurosciences, there was a lot of work um, supported by grants and led mostly by Jakob Stern and, and many, many others, but I think Jakob Stern is kind of recognized as the, the um, father of, of cognitive resilience. Um, a lot of work um, developing this idea of resilience very specifically for people who are studying the brain and dementia. <laughs> Then in 2016, I got to be part of the NIA workshop that the Division of Geriatrics and Gerontology held, did this idea of physical resilience to health stressors, not the kind of physical resilience that Barbara Resnick had developed years before, but physical resilience actually saying like from a physical biomedical standpoint, how well is the body going to be able to respond to this stressor? Um, and then um, there uh, was most recently, um, a workshop that, um, a series of, of conferences and workshops that I've gotten to be a part of um, that are trying to sort of bring all these different disciplines together. So I think at some point it was kind of recognized that this concept of resilience is resonating really well with so many people and especially across aging and it's kind of taking hold, but there's a lot of different groups that are developing their models and their frameworks and their measures and their definitions and not necessarily um, talking to each other or synergizing those, um, developing kind of fit for their own purposes. So, so this, this conference series, um, it, the, the PI of this conference series is Peter Abadir, who's here at Johns Hopkins. Um, I got to co-chair the first um, conference in the series with him. That was held in October, 2022. Um, it was kind of a, a, these conferences are funded by the National Institute on Aging and the um, American Geriatric Society, and they're sort of almost like uh, think tanks where they bring together sort of rising stars and thought leaders around some topic, um, and, and you try to advance the topic. So um, the, the, you can see on the figure that we have here what the three conferences in our series will be about, but the first one was about the overview of, of the resilience world, where we sort of compared all these different frameworks and had representatives from the psychological resilience world, the cognitive resilience world, and the physical resilience world all in the same room to kind of think about this together. Um, the next conference, which is coming up in March in just a couple of weeks, um, is on stress tests and biomarkers of resilience. And then the third conference will be on interventions and optimizing resilience. Um, the second conference is already full, but if anybody gets really excited about this or starts uh, moving down a road where you're particularly interested in being part of a third conference, um, I would we, we do an application process to attend these conferences and they're really great and a lot of fun. Um, and so I would encourage you to, to know about this, this opportunity. If, if especially if you take me up on what I'll get to, which is opportunities to collaborate on this topic of resilience. So the summary from conference one, which was this, you know, sort of think of it as like this big think tank meeting of the minds of Jakob Stern was there, we were there, all the people that kind of like um, have, have developed all of these frameworks and constructs and published on them. And at the end of the day, we sort of declined to come up with a single definition for resilience. Um, and the reason that we did that was it was clear that, that um, the horses were out of the barn, like the, the, these fields were already moving forward and, and had embraced the frameworks and the definitions and the, the concepts as they were using them in their fields. Um, and it seemed counterproductive to try to back it back up and have everybody sort of agree on like one single measure or one single framework. Um, and instead, what we sort of tried to do is say, well, let's recognize we use the metaphor of a tree and said, let's think of the, the trunk of the tree, the kind of big idea of all this is that individuals differ in the response to some sort of hardship or perturbation to their health. And it, this variation has significant implications for their downstream outcomes and health. That's the big idea. And then the way that you 
think of that, you measure it, the framework you develop around that big idea is almost like the branches of the tree that depends on what discipline or what branch or what, what specific domain of health you're focusing on. And we just encouraged investigators to sort of specify that um, and to be very careful. It's almost like, um, you know, use with caution. If you're using the word resilience, be aware that you may be saying resilience and be very rooted and very supported with evidence and, va and validated tests and frameworks of how you're using it, but you might accidentally be talking to somebody who has a totally different validated framework and, and, and understanding. Um, and there's obviously enough overlap in them that you can get pretty far into the conversation before you realize that you're kind of coming at it from totally, from slightly different frameworks. So what Peter and I um, wrote a, a little thought piece about this where we, we called for what we called a cosmopolitan appreciation of resilience in health research. Um, and we likened it with a metaphor we used here was talking about football. So if you're at a conference in the US and you meet up with friends and you start talking about football together and all the people who you're talking to were raised in the US and you talk about football, then you can be pretty assured that everybody is immediately gonna understand that you're talking about a game with helmets and tackles. But if you are at a European conference or a conference anywhere else in the world and you sit down at a table of people from around the world and you just start talking about football, if you could get a little far into it before you realize that some of you are talking about what we call soccer and some of you are talking about American football. And so in the same vein, to just be mindful, if you go out there at a GSA and talk about resilience, to just kind of <laughs> specify which of these frameworks um, you're talking about. So uh, this diagram is kind of our sort of um, pictorial that came out of that first um, conference, sort of doing a brief visual summary of, of the different frameworks that have kind of evolved in, in the major three domains of cognitive, physical, and um, psychosocial or psychological. I'm going to focus just on physical and cognitive, mostly because that's that's where I come in. <laughs> that's the two I feel most um, able to, to talk about. So I'm going to start first with cognitive, partly because this one um, was there first in the history. So, so Jakob Stern was doing this before. Um, much of the work on physical resilience has been elaborated at Duke and Johns Hopkins. Um, Jakob Stern was, was working on cognitive resilience before we got into the game. So um, the way that um, Jakob Stern and, and the cognitive resilience crowd has really defined this is that cognitive resilience very specifically relates to the capacity of the brain to maintain cognition and function in the setting of aging and disease. So if you think about a brain that has sustained some kind of um, either neurodegenerative condition, it has plaques and tangles of Alzheimer's disease or other neurodegenerative conditions, or it, it has suffered brain injuries or strokes, how well is it maintaining its ability to, to be cognitively performing well, despite some level of, of um, brain damage? And mechanisms that kind of underlie that could include cognitive reserve, which speaks to a way that I've heard Yaakov and others define it is cognitive reserve, you can think of it as the mind's ability to respond and adapt in the setting of brain damage. So this has to do often with sort of plasticity and, and a mind's ability to sort of um, be plastic and, and accomplish the same level of cognitive performance, despite the fact that it's it's got some brain damage. There's also these ideas of brain maintenance and brain reserve, which are much more at the molecular cellular level of saying um, brain reserve might be something that a person has in terms of some people are just born with higher synaptic density than it seems other people and or certain tracks that are anatomically different in one person or another, but support some function better if, if the brain were to sustain some kind of um, damage. Um, Brain reserve, it seems, can also be probably built with early um, educational opportunities and other sort of social determinants of health, although obviously we haven't done the randomized study of randomizing people to bad social conditions or good social conditions, and we know for sure that there's anything more than a, a um, correlation there. Um, and then uh, brain maintenance is this ability for the brain to sort of repair and, and maintain itself um, as it's being exposed to stressors such as limited blood flow and oxygenation or something like that. Um, this is the picture that you often see 
when people talk about cognitive resilience and cognitive resilience frameworks, what we're seeing is worsening. It, it, the the um, x-axis could either be time or just worsening a neuropathology, worsening, in this case, it's saying Alzheimer's disease pathology. And then the performance or the, the memory performance that we could measure and observe is on the y-axis. And the theory here is that there are people who start out with higher reserve, other people with lower reserve. The people with lower reserve typically start out with lower cognitive performance. And then there would be some point at which you begin to see this decline. But, but the slope of that decline could be different for people with higher or lower reserve. And the point at which the inflection point occurs. Now, the thing that I'm gonna point out and keep in mind as we move on to the physical resilience framework is that in this slide, everything is stable, 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 and then down. <laughs> There's no bounce back. Whereas physical reserve, physical resilience people love to talk about the art of bouncing back, the ability to bounce back. How, how do people bounce back and recover? And when we talk about our framework, people's hands do this. <laughs> and they sort of talk about, you know, there's, there's a stressor, people go down, and then they, they come back. In the cognitive resilience world, that's not really part of the framework, because as we know, with an aging brain, at a, at a population level, what we typically expect is a downward trajectory. And what we haven't seen, although new treatments on the, you know, on the horizon, maybe it could, it could happen. What we haven't typically seen is a recovery of cognitive function once it's lost. Um, so now I'm going to move to the physical resilience frameworks and do kind of a quick tour of those. So this is the Duke Pepper Center's conceptual model. So what we talk about before the stressor we never talk about measuring a person's resilience or quantifying a person's resilience before we see them stressed. Before the stressor, we talk about measuring their reserve, which really you could, we use almost interchangeably with something like intrinsic capacity. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a level of sort of reserve that a person has before they're stressed that we believe is the, the magnitude of their resilience is sort of um, restricted by their level of reserve, not 100% determined by it, but restricted by their level of reserve before. And that's where we would sort of conceptualize the scale of robust to frail. Um, for those of you who are familiar with that kind of related terminology, people kind of go into this uh, exposure to a stressor on some somewhere on the spectrum of robust to frail with varying levels of reserve, but that reserve could be in different domains. So we listed cognitive, psychological, and physical here, but you can imagine other domains too that are relevant. Then the person gets stressed in some way, and that could be a chronic or an acute stressor, but we are always thinking in our framework about a physical, a health stressor. Um, and then the, the magic of resilience for us happens in the dynamic response after the stressor. So you can only really measure, observe, quantify resilience in our framework after the person is stressed. And as you can see by that little ball, we often, in many cases, are expecting a trajectory that looks like a... Um, like that. So, so, so we are expecting a nonlinear um, recovery pattern. Um, and that resilience can be defined really variably by what we measure repeatedly. So what we sort of do is we're very interested in, in mapping out the trajectory with repeated measures, but you could imagine that it would be relevant to, to capture repeated measures of just independence function, I, you know, instrumental activities of daily living. It could be really important to measure repeated measures of some sort of ability, um, like perhaps hearing tests <laughs> over repeated times, um, or it could be like pain or quality of life, but some repeated measure that what we're sort of expecting is the person is stressed, that measure that it, that it matters to the person is affected adversely by the stressor and then it might recover. And then our hypothesis is that that resilience trajectory that is, is the dynamic thing that happens in direct response to the stressor, how well somebody recovers and the degree or the, the rapidness with which they recover should correlate to longer term outcomes of health. We've elaborated at Duke two different kind of approaches to measuring this. So we do use a phenotypic approach where, where we are truly just trying to describe and quantify 
the phenotype of that trajectory of repeated measures. This is highly descriptive. Um, we do sometimes um, quantify multiple different parameters of that. So we might look at the slope of the recovery from the nadir. Um, sometimes we look at the um, area, it's kind of an area under the curve of um, uh, area above the curve, I guess. Um, and then we can sum summarize multiple outcomes simultaneously. So in, in a current study we're doing with knee surgery, we measure afterwards people's effective health, their cognitive health, their um, gait speed and mobility health, and then their pain trajectories. And we're planning to do latent class trajectory analysis to kind of group those together. Um, you can also do principal components analysis or factor analysis to kind of try to, to be considering multiple kinds of, of, out, of resilience determinants at the same time. This is great in that it's very intuitive. What we have found is that it is often the differences in people's trajectories are largely driven by age, comorbidities, and pre-stressor function. That's not that surprising, right? Um, so we have developed this other approach that we use frequently when we're trying to get at what might be the mechanisms that, that underlie resilience in other ways. So here the idea is, a, is um, we take the population, we create a model for that that's relevant just to that population that uses information like their age, comorbidities, and pre-stressor function to predict where that person should be at, say, six months. And then we compare that to where they actually are at six months. So here what we get is kind of a measure of how much better or how much worse a person was doing than we might have thought they than we might have predicted they were going to do based on the stuff that we could know about them just clinically. Um, and we found that this approach has been really helpful in trying to, for example, identify biomarkers or um, other things that account for some of those differences between people and how much better or worse they do than you might have predicted they would do. Now, this I'm showing you. So, so our colleagues here, we work very closely with them. But interestingly, we, we worked entirely independently on coming up with our figures. But the, the similarity between them is pretty significant. So this is the Johns Hopkins Pepper Center conceptual model of physical resilience. They've organized the location of the boxes a little bit differently, but it's the same boxes. So the stressor hits this person's sort of, they call it capacity, we called it reserve. Um, it translates into phenotypes. They didn't draw out the little ball the way we did, but same idea, that's what they expect. You could measure lots of different things to draw out your trajectory. And then we hypothesize that how well people's trajectory goes correlates to their outcomes. So very similar sort of framework that we're using here. The other things that are underlying both of these frameworks at Hopkins and Duke, we completely agree on this, is that it's critical to sort of understand all of this in terms of every person being a complex dynamic system that is in a sense in a struggle to be at homeostasis or equilibrium, could constantly be perturbed off of that um, uh, equilibrium. And that's what the stressors do. And it's complex because underlying the whole person are multiple subsystems at varying levels um, of from organ networks to cellular networks down to the molecular and, and at the level of genes. And all of these are dynamic, sort of interacting with each other, feed forward, feed back, um, communication between all of the subsystems that, that um, is how we sort of um, conceptualize what, why we see a person when they're stressed and knocked off their, their homeostatic baseline. Different people have different abilities to sort of quickly regain that equilibrium that we imagine at the person level, what underlies that is this complex system. Then we also understand that that person is living in the other complex system, which is society. Um, so that whole, this whole idea of sort of complex dynamics is really also at the root of how we understand um, these frameworks. This notion that, that over time, complex systems begin to deteriorate. It's thought due partly to just stochastic little um, impairments and hits at, at, at random places in, in the complex system that reduces the whole system's ability to quickly and briskly and at little energy cost to itself get you back into equilibrium and homeostasis and, and good health when perturbed. Um, we also sort of envision this vicious cycle within a person where when a person acquires a new disease, 
It diminishes your biological resilience at some molecular cellular level. And then that lower resilience makes the person vulnerable to the next disease. So as a person who studies multiple chronic conditions, this is where resilience fits into this idea of an accumulating sort of avalanching um, multiple chronic condition framework um, where it's becoming a vicious cycle. Um, and then also we think that underlying this too is this idea of geroscience. So with geroscience being the notion that um, some, to some degree, there, there are these stochastic little random hits that could hit anywhere, but there are also a few key biological processes that exist in every cell, in every tissue, in every body. And we just know that those processes have an age-related decline associated with them. Some of it may be stochastic. Sometimes we, some there are theories too that it's not all stochastic and some of it may be sort of, sort of temporal clocking um, that happens at a biological level. But again, the idea of geroscience is that because we can name the critical biological processes that seem to be exhibiting an age-related decline across all kinds of cells, if we could do things to manipulate that biology and restore it to a more youthful, if you will, favorable biological pattern, then we could essentially be restoring resilience or improving resilient ability across all tissues and cells. So rather than having to come up with a treatment that's directed at diabetes or at heart disease, if we're targeting these biological pathways that are sort of potentially central to the aging process, then, then this could be a way to, to um, enhance resilience and enhance health um, at a whole person level. Um, all right, so that's, that's kind of the framework. So the cognitive resilience, physical resilience, just the takeaway here is that there are many different ways to operationalize the word resilience in your aging research. And I would argue that it's actually a helpful and a good shorthand way to do it, as long as you avoid the pitfall of accidentally sort of being kind of tone deaf um, to, to the whole soccer football phenomenon. As long as you're very clear in the beginning that you are aware that there are multiple frameworks, you're using this one, you're, you're defining it this way. And, and being very clear about that, I think is, is the way to, to navigate this um, in terms of our grants and paper writing. Um, and, and understanding that we can apply this, this concept of resilience to lots of different domains of health. Um, and even that the very same stressor could merit resilience research in a lot of different domains of health because the same stressor can impact different domains differently. Um, and then that we can observe resilience at all these different levels. Um, and, and the word resilience is used at all these different levels. Um, but again, specifying how and where you're using it is really helpful. So now I'm just gonna do this kind of one example. Um, this was a study that um, I started doing after this conference that was very similar. It was actually some years ago, but a conference in the same long running conference series that the NIA and the American Geriatric Society have co-hosted together. This was one a while ago where each conference in this series focused on a different pair of chronic conditions. And Frank Lynn and I co-chaired this one, um, focusing on the, um, the link between sensory impairments, specifically vision and hearing and cognitive functioning. So this was in 2018, it was similar kind of thing. It was a think tank of people who thought a lot about cognitive and brain aging and people who thought a lot about hearing and people who thought a lot about vision. And we kind of got them all in the same room. And this was, um, some of you may have seen this um, figure or, a, or a, a modification of it before, but this was the original one that Frank and I did at this conference. Um, and so I got interested in looking specifically here um, at, at this part of, of this um, figure. So the idea here was that, you know, it, we didn't know, it's still unknown, whether sensory impairments cause, directly cause impaired cognitive functioning, or whether it's just this sort of common etiology correlative association because of shared risk factors. Um, but we sort of listed out a few of the different things that if, if there is a hypothesized direct causal link between sensory impairments and cognitive function, maybe some of these things could account for, for that causal mechanism. And so I wanted to do a study that did kind of a deeper dive on understanding one form of sensory impairment and how that might be 
leading to differences in brain structure um, and also functional networks within the aging brain. So to do this, um, I am a geriatrician, so I um, need a lot of help to do this because I don't do imaging studies as my main bread and butter. Um, so, and also I, I to recruit the age-related macular degeneration patients, I in, involved a lot of ophthalmologists, um, but this was kind of a dream team of um, two retinal specialist ophthalmologists, Dave Madden, Alex Padilla, Guy Potter, who are, Guy Potter is a neuropsychologist, um, Dave Madden and um, Alex Padilla are both uh, cognitive neuroscientists and brain imagers. Um, and together, what we did was enroll 81 age-related macular degeneration patients. We got 85 people who were controls and that they were similar age, similar education status. Um, and in both cases, we excluded additional ocular comorbidity, which is actually really hard to find older people who have age-related macular degeneration and nothing else. Um, and then 85 controls that um, have lived to be a similar age. In this case, our mean age was 75 years old, and they really have healthy eyes. They have normal vision in both eyes, and they are free of, of ocular, um, major ocular comorbidities. If they had had cataracts, they had been removed. Um, so um, what we collected on them was at baseline, and then two years later, we did neurocognitive testing. Our neurocognitive testing really focused especially on verbal fluency uh, for two reasons. One, we were obviously trying to use only cognitive tests that don't directly require you to have good vision skills to do the test. So we were staying away from things like clock drawing and trails making, all the things that you and the cochlear center probably use all the time because you're trying to stay away from tests that rely on hearing. But we were trying to stay away from tests that rely on vision. So our tests were very auditorily cued um, and a potential limitation of, of, um, of the work. But um, the other reason that we focused a lot on verbal fluency, in addition to the fact that that's a test where I tell you to name all the words that you can think of that either start with a particular letter or start in a category like animals. There was previous epidemiological literature that had suggested that not only were people with age-related macular degeneration and vision impairment of any kind, at higher risk of lots of different kinds of cognitive dysfunction, but they seem to be particularly underperforming on tests of verbal fluency, and nobody knew why. It was, a, it was an interesting thing. We also did collect um, uh, Frank Lynn and Sarah Mamo. I don't know, some of you may know Sarah. They, she was here then, and they came down and visited me in Durham and set us all up for our um, hearing module that we did as part of this test with pure tone audiometry, speech and noise testing, and word recognition. We also collected a lot of eye and ophthalmological data on these folks. And then we did brain MRIs, both functional MRI and diffusion tensor imaging um, on everybody who was eligible to receive an MRI. It ended up being a little bit less than half of the cohort just because of the age of these folks, the number of people that had defibrillators or other exclusions to MRI. Um, as expected, our age-related macular degeneration group, even in this fairly small carefully curated kind of case control study. Our AMD patients still underperformed um, the controls to a statistically significant level, and especially in these kind of verbal and semantic fluency tests. Um, one of the key discoveries um, was that the AMD group at baseline had worse white matter integrity, but not globally. It was in specific tracks, and the specific tracks were the splenium, um, which I wish that this would spin, but, but the movie doesn't spin, but if that brain spinned around, it would show you the tracks and the splenium is the kind of horseshoe shaped um, track um, that really connects the occipital lobes or the visual cortex um, to the more front parts of the brain. And it's kind of a super highway of information. Some of the information that it, that it um, carries to those visual cortexes are, are coming straight from the eyes. So your eye delivers the information through the optic nerve to the lateral geniculate nucleus, and then it goes back to the back of the brain. But your occipital cortex also delivers information forward through the same tracks, the same splenium. So one way to, to think about it is it was very interesting to us that the splenium seemed to be what was really different in these two groups. Perhaps not surprising that in people who have um, suffered visual loss and so they have far less stimulation of this track because their retina just doesn't um, activate as much, it 
pushes less information back to the occipital cortex. So you might imagine that you'd see some white matter um, decline and deterioration in those tracts. Um, and that's what we saw. But one of the things that was, was interesting to us too is that is that those tracks are also really responsible over time from taking any information that your eyes see. And once your occipital cortex has made the basic sense of that image, such as shape, color, basic sense, that information then has to move forward to the parietal and frontal lobes for you to do things like use that information to recognize a friend or say their name or know if you're afraid of this person or not. Um, and, and all of that information could also be impacted by a deteriorated spleen. Um, so that was sort of the, the working hypothesis um, just uh, that we were beginning to develop even at baseline. The other thing that we saw two years later was that the AMD group also had a faster rate of deterioration in those same white matter tracts, um, the splenium, but also it was especially on the left side. These were all right-handed people, which means that their left side, again, is where their language facilities live. So over two years, the AMD patients compared to the controls were having faster deterioration in these left-sided um, language relevant um, regions. And then the third thing was that when we looked at the resting state data, the functional connectivity pattern, what we saw was that, that first of all, not all age-related macular degeneration patients had poor cognitive function. And in fact, those that, that in the age-related macular degeneration group, those that maintained better verbal fluency testing and better cognitive function, they had more activity on the right side of their brain. So there was a difference detected in, in the AMD group that was not detected in the cognitive group that the, this relationship between cognitive function and functional connectivity that we saw in the age-related macular degeneration group was in this kind of bilateral, frontal temporal, very language relevant network. And, in spe and specifically the way the groups differed in this network was on the right side. So it was, it was in AMD patients, but not controls, this right side was associated with better retained cognitive performance. So that was very interesting to us. And again, in kind of the resilience world, this is applying the kind of cognitive resilience framework of saying, in P if we're assuming that age-related macular degeneration and the white matter deterioration that is associated with it is the stressor to the brain, that is the sort of brain stressor, this seems to be a pattern that is conferring resilience to that stressor. Um, conferring the person with AMD to be able to perform cognitive tests better. Um, so just to kind of summarize that, um, the AMD group tended to underperform on the cognitive ta tasks, just as had been shown in previous epidemiological literature. The AMD patients had worse structural integrity and in tasks that, in, in tracks that are relevant for vision, but also relevant for semantic processing of visual information. We saw higher connectivity on the right side that was associated with this cognitive resilience um, in those AMD patients. And our working hypothesis was that maybe these people who were able to be cognitively healthy despite AMD either were just born with the right-sided track that, could, that was stronger and could kick in and kind of support some deterioration on the left side, or maybe this was plasticity and compensation. We won't know because it was an observational study. Um, and then um, what we didn't have in this study, and I'd love to have, is um, neuropathology. So what we don't know is if the AMD patients also had higher amyloid and tau um, in their brains that could have further accounted for why people with AMD um, may have these um, deteriorations. It may not all be just that they have vision loss, but that um, they are more likely to have Alzheimer's disease for, for some other probably more cellular reason. Um, okay. So now I'm just gonna, if, um, let's see, our last five minutes, I wanna just tell you about the data that we're collecting in the Duke UNC ADRC in case you see any opportunities. Um, so again, I think there's lots of opportunities to sort of think about hearing and apply resiliency questions um, to questions that are relevant to hearing health. Um, for those of you who don't know, there are 33 Alzheimer's disease research centers um, in the United States. 
Um, in the last cycle, um, Duke and UNC was awarded one. So we are one of the newest um, ADRCs. We've only been in existence um, about two and a half years. Um, but we certainly conceive of dementia as a disease of aging, not just the aged. Um, very mindful that, that the pathological changes of Alzheimer's disease and the other neurodegenerative dementias begin decades before we see this clinical syndrome of dementia. I'm sure you all are familiar with this um, Lancet work sort of um, detailing many of the factors across the lifespan that are, that are associated with dementia risk, hearing being a huge one. Um, so this is kind of our, um, what we think about in the Alzheimer's Disease Center is this idea that people inherit a certain genetic propensity to Alzheimer's disease at birth, but then most people live decades with that genetic propensity before it manifests. So what we're really focused on is trying to find what are the factors across the lifespan, either these biological sort of geroscience factors or things like comorbidities and the medications that people are exposed to and the social determinants of health um, that they experience across their lifespan that can drive the development of dementia, the progression of, of dementia and people's experience with dementia. Um, just this is kind of fun because we're Duke and UNC, the greatest sports rivalry in college history. Um, we have this little sub theme about basketball. So a lot of our naming conventions have something to do with basketball. Our annual event is called Slam Dunk and um, the coaches recorded little videos for us and stuff like that. Um, but the main goal that we have um, is to kind of offer unique um, data to, this, uh, to all the other 33 centers. The other 33 centers have mostly focused on enrolling people that already have dementia. We are purposely enrolling people who are younger and don't yet have dementia, but what they have is a family history or a APOE4 gene, a genetic risk factor for dementia. And we, have, we are targeting um, certain underrepresented groups and people from rural uh, North Carolina. We collect biofluids and data across this kind of midlife. We have a particular group that are perimenopausal women um, that get additional data to map where they are in menopause, um, as that's been related to potential Alzheimer's risk and the higher prevalence in women. Um, and then we collect novel data. The one I want to call your attention to is the sensory and mobility measures. Um, so um, we have two different cohorts that are getting sensory and mobility measures, and one of those sensory measures is audiometry. Um, so one of them, we're targeting 420 people ages 45 to 80 that will be followed each year. Um, we already have 212 um, and counting. Um, we can have up to 100 of them have symptom, cognitive symptoms when they come in, but 320 of them we're shooting for no symptoms when they come in. We also have this very young cohort, <laughs> really unique data, 100 people ages 25 to 44 who come in just one time. They can join the longitudinal cohort when they turn 45 if they want to, um, but we have 25 of our 100 people there. And both of the cohorts have pure tone audiometry, speech and noise, and word recognition. Um, this is where the studies happen. So people show up and it's mostly one-stop shopping. They have to go someplace else to get the MRI. Um, and some of them choose to get their lumbar puncture done in clinic. Um, but you can see that there's an audio booth. We don't actually use the audio booth um, to do most of our audiometry testing. We, use, we do the audiometry testing in a different room um, because the audio booth is being frequently used by our close colleague, Sherry Smith, who, who shares the space. Um, this is our ARENA database. Um, arena because sports again. Um, <laughs> and um, you can look at the QR code and go and look at this. It's a live, um, it updates every midnight. Um, and you can look at the number, you know, people that we have and how many men between this age and that age have NAPO E4 gene or have an MRI, or, um, but all of them have the audiometry data. Um, and that's it. So I just want to thank again that this this resilience work has been a huge team effort. So there's a ton of Duke collaborators. My closest is Kathleen Colonna Marique that um, we are MPI on most studies that we do about physical resilience. Um, and then also the group here at Johns Hopkins um, in uh, with Jeremy Walston, Peter Abadir, Ravi, and Karen um, are, are very, very close um, collaborators in this. All right. Thanks. We have time for questions. We can open it up to the room or if there's anything online there. Yes, Carl. Hey, um, 
So I had a question on how are you um, quantifying the term cognitive resilience in this term? So is it just an umbrella term for the uh, number of cognitive tests or it is just one particular test? How do you quantify that? Because you, there is a um, conclusion that also a group is has more cognitive resilience. How are you quantifying that? Yeah, good question. So the and the answer is that um, you the the user gets to choose. So sometimes it is a full battery of tests and kind of a global assessment of of cognition. Other times in the study that I did, we were very specifically looking at performance on these verbal fluency tests um, and using that verbal fluency as as our measure of of cognitive resilience to age-related macular degeneration. Um, but in other work, I've, I've seen people, and, and sometimes people just use memory tests. If the idea is um, the stressor is Alzheimer's disease pathology and how much amyloid burden somebody has in their brain, per se, say, because memory is kind of the, the um, most salient um, cognitive domain that is affected typically by Alzheimer's disease, sometimes I've seen people use just a memory test. Um, as, as the, the cognitive factor. Yes, sir. Very nice talk. I learned a lot. Thank you. So what about duration of exposure? Because different exposures, they have just different durations. And also, if there is any latency between exposure to the uh, stressor and occurrence of, you know, I did a study many years ago comparing widowed women with married women and after the death of the widowed. A month later, there was no difference in the CESD. But six months later, there was a big difference. It's almost like the duration of the exposure to a sick husband, for example. Yeah. To create some sort of habituation. Yeah, so, so that's a great question. And just touched on what I would say is one of the biggest limitations that we have in advancing resilience research using existing data and secondary analysis of existing data sets, a lot of times there's not granular information on the stressor itself, on the magnitude of the stressor or the duration of the of the stressor, and sometimes even on what other, other stressors may have happened um, in the interim, or if that same stressor might have happened twice. You might have data and you know that people came in and they had one heart attack, but you don't really have um, other, and then for, for um, stressors like the one that you're mentioning that could have a different duration. I think that's so important and is one of the reasons that some, you know, you hate, you hate when there's so much secondary data out there to be able to play in. You hate to go and do a, <laughs> a whole lot of perspective collection, but sometimes in this you just have to because we don't have those measures. The other thing that you're bringing up that is really interesting is this idea of hormesis, that there are some stressors that we believe that exposure to the stressor actually improves your resilience to the next stressor rather than just being a, a, a bad um, exposure. Sort of the idea of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, and so exercise is an intervention that is actually considered a hormetic stressor because the idea is you stress yourself in order to get stronger. Um, so one more point, you know, so some stressors, you know, they're punctual. Like for example, a sudden unexpected death of a relative. Yeah. So there might be other stressors that are also like acute. Yes, I would say that I have um, cheated a little bit in resilience research because I have used elective knee replacement as my stressor in my paradigm, not because, I hate to say this, but not because I care about elective knee replacement more than anything else in the world, but because it is, uh, it's acute and it's planned. So I can, I can, and it's common. So I can find a lot of people that are about to have that stressor that's pretty planned, that's pretty uniform and is definitely planned. And I can do a lot of testing on them before the stressor, then they get stressed, then I can follow them. Um, but it, it is harder to do that with other kinds of stressors. Thank you. I do see that we're at time. Um, I think there's lots of ways I'd like to continue the yeah. conversation, but I do just want to thank you for such an amazing talk. I feel like Something like this, summarizing the state of where we are, so important for our students because this language is confusing, Yes, but also so important for the field. I think we did spend a lot of time spinning wheels and arguing over definitions, and this really gives us a path forward. So thank you for being here. We're really appreciative. Um, if you can join me again in thanking Dr. Whitson. <laughs>